Hi, everybody. It is my pleasure to introduce Beth Stewart, who is our visiting artist today. Beth uh, did her undergraduate work at Concordia University in Montreal and her graduate work at the University of Guelph. She has uh, recently exhibited a solo project at the Esker Foundation in Calgary, Alberta, which is the image that we see on the poster here. Uh, she's also participated in the painting project, a kind of encompassing exhibition curated by Louise Derry at Uquem, again in Montreal. And as she was one of uh, the artists invited to uh, make work for a, a large uh, piece that Michael Lexier created, that kind of surveyed uh, artists who work with black in uh, Toronto. Uh, the exhibition was presented at the power plant. In 2010, Beth was shortlisted for the RBC Painting Prize, and in 2011, she received an honorable mention also in the RBC. She's represented by Batat Contemporary in Montreal. Please join me in welcoming Beth Stewart. Hi. Um, so I part of this jam is that I, I kind of got asked to talk a little bit about not quite professional development, but like moving into life as an artist. And um, I'm taking that kind of uh, tangentially. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about research and what that word means to me um, as somebody who is kind of continually um, faced with the gap between research as a kind of practice of looking at things outside of myself and research that is really foundationally grounded in making stuff, like the actual things in my hands. And the part of the reason why I'm thinking about this right now is because I am I'm kind of uh, in a period of questioning, like I think a lot of people are. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, out there in the world and I'm thinking about I'm thinking a lot about um, how do I say this? It's sort of like uh, kind of somebody has a thing that says a senior bible here and, uh, and uh, there's a joke about the kind of like you know how secular art school really is and how um, spiritual practice comes into um, people's lives in very personal ways and how it's not kind of maybe um, overtly part of an uh, institutional learning practice, but part of this idea that I have been dealing with on a kind of quiet level in my work for a long time has been about um, process and practice and research outside of myself as a, as a kind of se secular spiritual practice. and. That is not very fashionable, but uh, it's what is going on. Um, and the closest thing that I would drop as a title on that is a, about animism. And animism is a kind of belief in the in the life of inanimate things, and specifically historically related to things in the world that are organic, like rocks and trees, and. Uh, but I also think that that extends into artwork. Um, so I'm going to go through. There's some there's some images of my work, um, and then there's some images of things that have kind of influenced me. And I'm going to talk about yeah this kind of zone of research that I am dealing with right now. And I'm starting this by saying uh, I do not I I I don't I I'm like trying not to uh, talk about artwork from any position of authority. So here I am with a microphone trying to tell you that I am not <laughs> talking from a position of authority. <laughs> um, so I saw, I was in graduate school um, and I was had been making really figurative paintings and 
uh, I kind of got sick somehow or like bored with looking at images and then the translation from images to a thing in front of me. And I was thinking about how to kind of shift that and break that up and uh, thinking also about how I didn't really relate to abstraction as I perceived it in terms of like a modernist practice um, and specifically about how like that kind of denied the body and was all about a kind of rational thinking and a kind of erasure of um, like the messiness that is a body. So I was thinking about an abstraction that kind of felt real to me. Um, one of the things I saw was um, this exhibition by Franz Erhard Walter, who is a German artist still living, and uh, I saw it in New York, and he was dealing with like a lot of the same kind of things that his contemporaries were dealing with. Um, Joseph Boyce making things that were abstract forms, but also really, he was not interested in them being fixed, like a static thing that you would look at on the wall. Um, there was a lot of kind of like performance implicated in these things. Um, and for some reason, because, so like this work that you see here is from 1983, but um, this one is from, 1964, and he was kind of anomalous, like John was saying that Joseph Boyce said that, made fun of him for being a tailor, but um, uh, you know, there's something very kind of like uh, permeable about this work, and funny, and it was really out of time and out of sync with what was happening with his contemporaries, and um, anyway, there's something here that just really shifted for me. Uh, Louise Bourgeois was another one. Um, I would say that she is like a, a fierce, fiercely animist uh, human being. Um, and then this is where it comes back to painting, um, surrealism in general. Like I was thinking about figure ground relationships and specifically how abstraction for me was like, you know, a kind of erasure of a figure ground. And I wasn't interested in that. I was kind of thinking more about what could exist between a figure and a ground, like what, uh, like how you could kind of have a, a body implicated in an image and, and yet have it not be there to kind of touch the edges of your your own self. So surrealism was a, another kind of zone I was looking at. And also I was interested in surrealism because they were really sexist and really problematic and a lot of the writing was like kind of alien and hyperbolic to me but in a way that I found pretty fascinating. Um, so this is like early coming out of graduate school so the other the other thing that I would say is that in order to kind of like push myself out of working from images, I started producing work that was based on this writing by Lucy Lepard, who was a like kind of feminist historian, and she, she wrote this book called From the Center in the 60s, and it was, it was just kind of describing work in women's studios that was not being seen in the world, and she, she had all these kind of descriptions of what the stuff looked like, and there was a lot of, like, there's holes, there's folds, there's internal space. And this text is, it was, like, I read it, and simultaneously, in the same way that I found a lot of surrealist writing really problematic, I also found this text really problematic, because it's sort of, like, it sort of, you know, it does this thing which is called essentialism, where it describes what the work that women make is. And, you know, it, the, we have, gone, I feel like, so far past that kind of, um, in a nutshell, description of what, what, like, what a woman is. But at the same time, it was really fascinating to me because, because we don't describe artwork in that way anymore. And in some ways, there's no way to talk about visual things without having a correlative, without saying this thing looks like a bag, or this thing looks like a, uh, like a drip, or this thing looks like uh, like reproductive organs. It's really hard to kind of have um, have a position without something to push against when you're looking at something visual. So 
I started starting to, I, I sort of used these texts, I literally took these texts and started painting my kind of, like, my kind of interpretation of what these written down descriptions were as a way of kind of mechanizing myself out of, out of working from images. And thinking about like a complicated kind of figure ground relationship. So there's some motifs that come up again and again for me. Holes, bags, space that is shallow, space that is like a cast shadow is another thing that keeps coming up for me. Um, this is uh, another sort of point of influence. So Eva Hess um, and this particular work uh, which is called Hang Up, which there's like no documentation of this thing being um, consistent. Like, it's actually really hard to document what this thing looks like because um, it doesn't have a kind of fixed orientation. Um, and people talk a lot about what it's about, and it's hard to say. Like, um, so yeah, I'm kind of in paintings, and then I'm kind of moving outside of paintings at the same time. This is also Eva Hess. Before this, before, sorry, before Hang Up, um, she made these things that were kind of in between paintings and sculptures, and I got really kind of fascinated with this space. This is a really famous shot of her studio, and you can, like, I mean, I think the, the, the like, associations with my paintings are really clear, but, um, yeah, like all of these objects for me function as being three-dimensional and non-three-dimensional at the same time. They kind of are like holes in a picture plane, and they are also they also have form, and that is something that every everything that I make hopes to kind of occupy, like some really fine line between being a dimensional thing and a and a non-dimensional thing, two D and three D. Um, so. I started making paintings that were not rectangles um, as a kind of way to push myself out again, farther away from um, something that, like in this zone of two-dimensionality and three-dimensionality. Um, this is early work, and this was the, like, this is some, something that I still kind of do, is I will generate the, the, the form before I thought of a painting. So I would have, like, I would cut out a shape, and then I would have to kind of figure out what the painting would be that would occupy that shape, rather than, like, kind of conceiving of a composition beforehand. I would have to kind of come to the thing and struggle with what, what would work in that, in that form. These are all small, like, um, kind of portrait-sized things. So that is like, you know, me coming out of grad school. And I was trying to think about, it. So this is the beginning of this kind of like emergence of thinking about, about, about object making in relation to spirituality. And part of this is a personal narrative. Like I came from a, I came from a Quaker background and it, I, it's, it's like a little bit too hard to like delineate what that means, but I was raised as a Quaker, which is a cat, it's a, it's a Christian kind of uh, sect, I guess, but um, it's non-hierarchical. There's no, there's no, uh, there's no preacher. And in fact, there's a lot of Quakers that are non, they're secular. They don't have, they're non-theist Quakers. But the bottom line is that it's about, like, um, it's about kind of community and, like, friendship. They're literally called the, like, community of friends. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's it, like you know, I was kind of problematizing this this upbringing for me, and in relation to an education that was really divorced from like it so, was so so kind of secular and don't talk about spiritual practice at all, and thinking about what what the meaning of I don't know what the meaning of that is. I don't have any I don't have any I don't have any I'm not coming to any conclusions, but. Um, one of the things that was going on is that I was researching, doing a lot of research into um, originary female figures that 
um, dealt with their spirituality in a way that like occupied the physical world. Um, so <laughs> this is like a quite abstract, but um, so I was thinking about like thinking about thinking about yeah phys physical being and abstraction and spirituality. Um, and this body of work came out of came out of that kind of practice. I was there were three. So basically, I wrote as a spine. This is a show in Montreal. As a spine for this exhibition, I had used a text collage. Um, one of the voices in this text collage. So I've taken historical texts and kind of chopped them up to make a dialogue. And one of the voices in this text is uh, a 14th century French mystic named Marguerite Porret. And she was really interested in having a kind of physical relationship to spirituality. And she, you know, she was eventually burned as a heretic and had a, an extraordinarily difficult life. But she, she is one of the, the kind of voices, and she's the spiritual voice in this kind of like zone that I'm thinking about. And the second voice is George Bataille, who was a surrealist, and I, I copied like the text collage copied um, this really juvenile piece of erotica that he wrote called The Story of the Eye, which is just, it's like, it's just, it's a pornographic text. Um, so you have on one hand, this, these three kind of voices in my studio. On one hand, a kind of idea of spirituality. On the other hand, a kind of idea of sexuality or or a libidinal play, something that's very grounded in 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 like the immediate physical body and then on the third hand a kind of rational voice which is like the academic voice my 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 schooling my teaching and the th so we have these three voices marguerite Porret, george bataille and um the third text was from uh paul clay and he, it's a lecture that he gave on modernism and abstraction. And it's really, it's really like this kind of fierce, full of um, vim and vigor conversation about how we have to avoid making associations between the things that we see in front of us and things that are in the real world. How that is, the, that is a huge pro like problem. And um, which is, you know, a kind of, which, which is the argument of, of modernism in some ways. Um, so yeah, I wrote this, I have this text, it's these three voices kind of collaged together, and I'm thinking about all three of these voices propelling me to make work in the studio. Um, these these uh, objects that I'm showing you were just kind of uh, tot little totemic objects that were at the as, as an introduction to the, uh, to the show. They were sort of figures for each of these voices. And these are the paintings in the show. I'm moving farther and farther away from the rectangle. Um, these things, if you want to know what they are, it's basically like a plywood form and then I've plastered it. So getting even like closer to something that is accidental and that I have to like confront making a thing out of, I cut, I cut out um, plywood and then plastered it and uh, and you have something that has like no predictable kind of edges to it. If you have technical questions about what this is, just just shout it out. I don't mind. I'm just gonna move kind of quickly through these things, but these are all they're all like again quite small sort of portrait sized things. These these particular ones are they're like they they've been gessoed. Um, now I'm actually right now I don't have images of it, but right now I'm working with with plaster that is um, like uh, pigmented in and of itself. It's like a marble plaster, Venetian plaster. But these these end up being the surfaces end up being quite close to traditional like painting surfaces. It's been gessoed and sealed. So Beth. Just for example, with this painting, mm -hmm. once you've got the plaster on there, the yep. surface is already. Oh, how, how did you make the painting? Like what? There, there's various stages and various media. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, this one, this particular one, is all oil paint, I think. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Um, like, are you asking techni technically how it got built up, or how did the image get? How did the image get sort of? Oh. Okay. So, I mean, I I did have I did have kind of like I and I still do have these kind of basic criteria for what I want in the picture, and that is like that there would be this kind of associative thing, like like it, like I look at this and I think about natural forms, like I think about birds, and I think about a garment, um, and that there is some, there has to be something in it that feels like something that you would kind of recognize. So that's one part of it. Um, I, did, I do tend to start with a mark, like I start with, so this one for example would have started with the black, the like black form, and I sort of like carve, kind of carved out an image from that material. Um, I don't know. It's a tough. It's a tough question. Like, and and maybe answered like predominantly in like like intuitively. Like I, you know, I have this shape which I have constructed for myself without a predetermined idea of what the painting, what the composition is going to look like, and then I have to kind of figure out how how to deal with that shape. I don't know how else to, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't mean to go too nope. off topic because I don't want to you know, distract you from this too much, but, but you, you're basically, you're building an accident, really. You're, yes. You're constructing an accidental shape. Yes. How is that possible? <laughs> um, well, the only way that I can, the only, the plaster is re a really important part of it. So, like, I, I, I I think I was tr I'm I was trying to and am trying to in this idea of coming to something that's between something that's dimensional dimensional and non-dimensional trying to think about you know like what as a painter when you have a liquid thing and then you are trying to construct uh, an image out of a liquid thing and that process being a kind of a, a like a, a str it's not a struggle, struggle, whatever, but like that it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very elastic process. There's no kind of fixed way of moving through that. You have habits and te you know, you're taught certain ways, but um, I was trying to sort of take that idea of paint and move that into dimensionality. So the, the, the accident or that kind of like stretched out like space of possibility um, for the form is is like the plaster is really important to that. So like I can't I can't control that much what those edges look like. You know like I can't it doesn't you know there's no math there's no math there's no like it's not a concise kind of thing. I do control to a certain extent what the original form is, but. Yeah, I mean, and the other, the other, the only other thing I would say is like, so there's 12 paintings in this show, and there's probably 30 or 40 paintings in the, in the, in this body of work, most of which got tossed, because, they, because I had too much control, I was making too many decisions along the way, the accident didn't kind of emerge. Does that make sense? What about just using um, a found shape? A found but shape. You would do frequency. In any shape, or, and then you deal with it. Would that be more of an accident? I don't know. I mean, well, at least the shape would be an accident. I think you see that coming up in in sculptures later on, where it's hard to determine. Like there are, I do bring some found objects into the sculpture, but it's very important for me that those found objects don't, like you can't quite tell whether I made them or whether I found them. Um, and I don't know, it's true, I could like paint on things that I find, but I feel like I feel like I haven't encountered those things yet that are the, that would be the right things for me to paint on that wouldn't have to like pull too much from to pull bring too much narrative into it. Does that make sense?
yeah, so again, there are like some marks, some repetitive marks that usually start start the thing off. Like you can see these kind of like pattern marks. So this is an installation shot, and like typically, you know, I did this thing that painters often do which, when they start to make sculpture, which is to like dump a thing in the middle of the room, you know, like <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but I wanted to, I wanted to sort of see what, what, um, what the kind of materials of the painting would be if I brought them into three-dimensional form. If I could still kind of hold on to this fragility between something being there and two-dimensional and three-dimensional. So what you're looking at in the middle of the room is this porcelain chain. Um, so it's link by link um, ceramic um, chain and it's 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 been wound around a, a like an armature but it kind of makes this stacked form. And it is kind of holding hands with this piece of linen. So, it, you know, in some ways, it's like it's like a really literal interpretation of the materials that the paintings are made out of. You have this thing that is like a porous, plastery kind of thing, and then the linen that the paintings are constructed on, and then a, just a little bit of paint. Um, so I'm going to breeze through the next slides, um, just saying that uh, the the I wanted to kind of deconstruct the the painting support even further, and I happened to get a grant to do that, and it was through research into this Danish weaving technique, which is called sprang, and it's something that I'm still using now, but. Um, it is basically like if a fabric has a warp and a weft, uh, an up and a down, like a side, but, but yeah, an up and a down that form a grid. Um, sprang is made as a braid, so it's it doesn't like it doesn't have a weft. It's it's every string is kind of contingent on the next string. So what that means is if you cut one thread, then the whole thing will kind of unravel. It's also very stretchy. It takes the form of what you put in it. So it's, like, it's kind of like hammock, like a hammock material, but there's no knotting involved. You just basically would have one thread and it's continuously braided upon itself. So I was interested both in this thing. Again, you come to this point where it's like the material, the material research, the actual making of the thing and the the kind of like metaphorical consistency of the thing are meeting each other at this certain point and you know I could like it this this process felt to me like the closest thing that I could get to this axis idea of an accident like how do I construct an accident how how can I go to a support that has like as little kind of as little form as is possible. I don't know. I still. This is a TBD kind of like. I don't know what. I don't know whether it 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 can be a painting support, um, but it's it's definitely something that I keep kind of coming back to. So, this is um, what this is like woven out of the same material that the linen, like same kind of linen that uh, like I would have made paintings on, and it's this pair of tights basically. I was interested in this little body of work in thinking about bondage to like bondage to conventions of painting, bondage to an image, bonding bondage to like you know what we think of as being an object, what we think of as being a painting. So there's this these kind of like nods to bondage hardware. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's like ceramic hardware that I have made. And there is again, just a little bit of paint. This one is leather, the same kind of, that's a, it's, it's um, 
using the same that sprung form um, and a sort of three-quarter sized uh, version of a clothes hanging rack. And did you make the rack or is that a found? I did, yeah. Yeah. I don't I don't tend to yeah, with the, some small exceptions, I don't tend to if I I tend to make the thing. So this one I feel like is the one that I keep coming back to again and again and again and it's because it is it does it does all these things that I'm interested in. It is an object, it is uh it has all kinds of reference to me. It looks like a smile, it looks like a, a uh, it looks like female reproductive organs. It looks like uh, this kind of domestic object, like a towel rack. It's kind of funny. It, it's like, it's very mysterious without being um, kind of arbitrarily mysterious. Like it doesn't, it doesn't, it it doesn't kind of empty itself out of meaning. It is all kinds of things at the same time. Um, what it is is like construction-wise, it's painting linen, like you would make a painting out of and I've extracted the warp from the middle section of it like removed the removed the vertical threads and then rewoven it with this sprung technique you can kind of see a detail here and again there's just a tiny bit of paint so yeah this is like a this was like a kind of condensed moment body of work and the this material is coming up again especially recently for me but um, we'll see um, back to this kind of research thread um, the work at the Esker foundation uh, was based on, and this is a continuous project that is going on and will continue, will go on probably until a foreseeable end, which I don't, like, I don't, an unforeseeable end, I don't know when that's going to happen, but basically I'm looking at these three women, one of whom is Varvara Stepanova, and she was a constructivist textile designer, and she, she did a lot of pattern work, um, and she also designed these sports costumes for the kind of ideal Soviet socialist citizen. And they, for me, these, these structures are so interesting and problematic because when you apply them to a human body, it does just, they just stop sort of making sense. Like they, you know, they, they, the geometry is so important to, to them that when they yeah when they're applied to a, a form they they stop holding their their they stop holding themselves up kind of literally and to me that's kind of this amazing relationship to her politics and the politics of the time and where you know where we are at as far as idealism these days um, the second person in this research is Florian Stettheimer. So again, this is this is my rational voice. I still have this rational, libid libidinal, spiritual voice going on. So the second point in this research is Florian Stettheimer. She was a turn of the century um, uh, New York socialite, and she, you know, she was she was around. She made these kind of wild, often very ugly, um, florid like epically kind of celebratory paintings. Um, and she performed her her gender in a way that was, she was a dandy in a way that was completely outside of what was permissible for women at the time. And it was permissible for her because she was wealthy. Um, she, she, had, she had a family that could kind of support her, but she, yeah, she was a, a kind of a wild spirit. Um, so you have your rational, and then she is definitely the libidinal, and this is idocratic. And idocratic was um, nothing to do with art, but she was um, this. She was a, a prohibition era pamphleteer for women's sex, um, like for basically for women to to experience um, 
like a, 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 have a kind of positive, positive sexual experience with their partners. And she was also a Quaker. And she also, at the end of her life, kind of went really far into like occult, occultism and, and spiritualism and wrote books about fucking angels. I don't know. She's pretty rad, though. Um, so, yeah. Like, I'm kind of looking at these historical figures out of the time that they existed in and thinking about them as informing my own studio practice and thinking about the possibilities for having these kinds of intense idealisms now and how 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 did and how it was for them too but you know i can't i can't project myself too much into that but yeah so i'm like thinking about these voices and they're kind of talking to me in the studio and i'm producing a written work which is a play um using these three voices and uh and also producing objects and paintings that i think of as props for this play props and kind of costume design and set pieces for this play. So this is um, the beginning of that. Again, it's, uh, it like looks like a skewed photograph, but the paintings are not square. Like quite, they're quite not square. <laughs> Um, yeah, so this is an example of having a found object and something that I made myself, like, like to me that thing is like an accidental, that, that thing is like a, that thing is like a painting and it's, it does have a, it does have a narrative, like it's a bowling ball, but it also feels like it's, it, I don't know, it just it fu functions in this way that I could have made it, but it's it's kind of hard to tell what 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 it's what it's what it is where it's from in time or place so for me each of these things is associated with one of these characters the this show had a thing that was like um the paintings are kind of like a costume design and then these stat these stats kind of statuary forms i was thinking about them as kind of dress forms like you know like bodies on which costumes could be hung, um, preposterous bodies as they are. Um, and then there's a third thing, so there's a painting, this kind of dress form, and then there's a third thing which is, uh, I'm thinking about it like a prop or some kind of like animus time traveling object. This particular thing is paper mache and then there's some chain and you don't see it but at the end of the chain there's some macaroni yeah so the found the found objects start to come in a little bit like here there is a pair of earrings which I bought but um, and this thing is a found object but again, again, I don't really, I don't necessarily want it to be easy to identify that thing as being from this world or from this time. So yeah, this is carved wood, carved ebony, and then there is some macaroni. Um, The macaroni comes up again. Like the macaroni for me is like this. It's again this kind of the same form, which is like a smile, and also um, this kind of like celebratory form. And it also has. It also like it does like food is funny no matter what. Like you eat it and then you poop it out, and it's pretty funny. <laughs> Um, but it has it it has this ability to kind of take the seriousness of the object or the form and pull it out of time and kind of place place it place it in 
place it in itself. Like, it's the libidinal voice. It's the it's the like playful voice. Um, I also think particularly macaroni, and I've been working with popcorn a little bit lately too. But um, macaroni is like a it's like a thing that is um, it's like ultimately culturally appropriative thing. Like there, it's it's like so uh, so American, and yet it doesn't like it. Ju- it just is kind of this like meaningless form. (laughs) Um, So we are looking at the show from the Esker Foundation and again I'm still working with these three figures. You have Varvara on the left or on the left and then Florine in the middle and uh, Ida on the right and um, this is like as directly related to kind of like a stage set as you can imagine. There is this literal stage there. It's kind of this folded form that could not be stood on by a real human. And then uh, facing this form is um, this sculpture, which is, it's called a proposal for a viewing apparatus. And you know, it has again, relation to the human body, but um, it was based loosely on a uh, a costume design for Mother Ginger, which is this nutcracker character who is, she has a giant skirt and all these little babies come running out from underneath her skirt and she can't really, she can't really, she can't really move. Like she just kind of stands on stage and, and shifts around a little bit. But this is literally like the armature for this is literally a, cop- a kind of copy of the armature for this, the costume of this character. Um, yeah, eleven, eleven. Um, these paintings are rectangular, but. Yeah, I haven't. Um, again, I haven't. I haven't really concluded this this passage of work. Like things are kind of shifting away from here momentarily right now. Um, but uh, it's going to come back to these three characters again. I think. Um, okay, so. This is the this is the most kind of recent thing, and this it hasn't manifested in any objects yet. But I'm working towards this show at the power plant, which um, is based around the Victorian bathing machine. And what this thing was was a covered wagon that would get drawn into the water by usually by a horse, sometimes by a winch, um, and. E- People, generally women, would go into the into this structure fully clothed, and then um, get pulled into the water, and then change into some slightly less cumbersome woolen bathing outfit, and get pooped at the back of this thing. Um, usually, there was somebody, and this happened here as well. Like you know, sunny. There were these things around Sunnyside Beach too. Um, Usually there was somebody there that would help the person into the water because there, there was, you know, there was no uh, people didn't actually really know how to swim, but and you were quite likely to drown because of your uh, your woolen bathing costume. But the person who would help you into the water was usually a kind of working class, like like fisherman if you were a man inside this bathing machine or a. a, a fisherman's wife, if you were a woman inside this bathing machine. Um, and so there was like a kind of class structure too. So I, for a lot of reasons, am interested in this thing. Um, first, because I feel like as a kind of symbolic space, 
um, of transformation, of like kind of birth, of baptism, um, and also just to think, like I'm also thinking about it in relation to contemporary art and galleries and uh, the absurdism of going into a space and thinking that something kind of magical or transformational is going to happen. Um, and I'm also thinking about it in terms of the environment that we live in, the, the how little we think about this, but particularly in Toronto and in Canadian cities, how structured and um, controlled our environment is by this particular moment in time, by Victorian aesthetics. Um, and even our, even our moral codes and the way that we behave with one another, how how they were birthed out of a time of like re real, really like ex simultaneous extraordinary repression and also change. Um, and anyway, this thing, this weird anomalous thing is on my mind. And also the form itself, for me, it does this thing. It's like a, it's like a, a, a an architectural form, it's a structure, and it also collapses. It has no function and yet it is like eminently functional. It's a, it's like a, it's a wild, it's a wild thing, this thing. So I'm working, doing some work to actually make um, a sculptural interpretation of this and a fully functional one which will get hauled around. Um, I'm also thinking at the same time about um, embodying this particular character whose name was Martha Gunn, and she was a very famous dipper. She was a very famous one of these people that helped people into the water. And um, I don't actually really, I don't swim very well, but I'm undergoing some training to do this, to be able to do life-saving. And uh, um, yeah. And then, the third aspect of this project, which will manifest in something that is much more like paintings, is based around the costume designs of a woman named Madeleine Vionnet, who was a, uh, she invented the bias cut. So this is kind of like the opposite of the constructivist textile designer, Barbara Stepanova. This person invented the bias cut, and what the bias cut is, is it's, it's like, um, if you cut on the diagonal of a piece of fabric, it then has the ability to kind of stretch and move. So prior to the invention of this, there was like clothes were really architectural. They had a lot of um, like um, uh, stays, a lot of hardware <laughs> associated with them. And this allowed a kind of, th these garments, the invention of the bias cut allowed a lot of physical movement that was previously not really possible for women. So if you think about all those flap, flapper dresses, they um, used the bias cut, you know. She also was really like a kind of uh, ardent um, advocate for abolishing the corset. But she, she, I became interested in her because these forms, it's like, the, yeah, it's like the opposite of Stepanova. Like these forms are a kind of pragmatic potential embodiment of the three-dimensional in this real, really real way. Like they really, um, she really had some kind of vision for what, th how this translates into three-dimensional form, how this becomes something that is like eminently mobile. Um, she also designed a lot of bathing costumes um, before bathing costumes were permissible. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in using these kind of patterns emblematically and doing interpretations of them and producing some garments with them and producing some murals with them. But, yeah. So, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, with 10 minutes left, and uh, ask if you guys have any questions for me.
Well, I guess the thing that's really striking about a lot of your work is that you're fascinated with the late 19th and kind of the turn of the century, um, which is sort of the creation of modernism, you know, before about the latter of modernism as we understand it. So I'm just wondering, um, you know, not many artists would uh, draw on the sources you draw upon. Uh, and I just wondered what your, you know, how that all began, how, what led you to that, that period, a period of great uh, invention in terms of uh, new religion as well, many of which, you know, emigrated from the United States and Canada. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think a lot of it is about, um, like speaking of bondage, feeling, although it doesn't, like recently, in recent days, um, I would say that this is less true, but a lot of it was about thinking about what the potential for art to embody change or for idealism to exist is right now and really confronting that in terms of my own education. Like, you know, when I went to school, undergrad in the 90s, it was, really like painting was really not a cool thing to do and um and the and generally like generally speaking there was a kind of ironic inflection on everything there was very little kind of thought that um certainly that art could embody social change or that, you know, like, citizens had much agency in general. Um, so I think a lot of it is coming out of, out of a, a sense of, like, wanting to look for, um, look, look for, look at, at least look at ideology in relation to art and think about what, where the kind of where the where the holes are like where the where the the minor voices are where the kind of like f fragments are at the edge of that that don't that don't sit easily in relation to that ideology and and specifically as a way of relating to um, myself as an as an agent of like creative production or social change you know like now and what possibilities exist, if that makes some sense. Like, and I don't, like I say, it's like, a, it's hard for me to think about that as a, coming from a position of authority, because it's very much about looking for non-authoritative voices inside spaces where a, a, a authority was kind of primal. Yeah. I'll ask another question then. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it, I, I remember back in the 70s when I would, would go to the MoMA, there were very few women represented uh, in, in uh, the work that you saw in the galleries, the work that surveyed their collection. Yeah. And I remember in the early 80s, Florine Stettheimer popped up. Now, Florine Stettheimer's work was in the collection of the MoMA, but it hadn't been shown for many, many decades. Uh, I think it would be fair to say. Um, you know, and, and she had a relationship with, you know, the moment through, you know, by virtue of the fact she was a member of the ruling class and so on. Um, so, but still, I don't think she's all that uh, well known. And, and now the AGO is going to do a retrospective of her work coming, coming up this year. Mm -hmm. um, and she is, you know, a, a, a very, uh, as you mentioned, you know, a very problematic uh, artist in that she deals with all kinds of kitschy conventions and, and kind of uh, picture postcard views of New York and, yep. and commercial brands and so on. So uh, I just wondered what your thoughts were on Stepheimer and also if you could think a little bit about, I, I mean, out of all your sources, she seems to me to be the one that's the least uh, in keeping with your interests as you've outlined. Yep. Well, and I mean, in some ways, like, that libidinal voice is, is like, you know, is always kind of the one that is, like, it's a little bit embarrassing, you know, it's a little, um, not, not, that, not to say that, like, in this, in this kind of zone, the spiritual voice can also be a little bit embarrassing, too, but, um, 
uh, I think I'm like with her specifically there is a certain amount of like joy that is perceptible in the paintings like you know talk talking about talking about like a talking about a lack of uh, I'm just gonna unplug this talking about a lack of uh, irony um, there's something I, I guess it, for, for me the interest she's she wasn't an ideologue by any means like but for me the interest there lies in the kind of like innocence of the work that she did like and it, it does feel like the paintings the paintings feel like that they feel like so they feel so sincere and you know she wrote poetry and it was quite bad poetry but it was so like it was so kind of alive <laughs> in this way and that in a way that is not there's no permission for for that to exist now like and it and it's interesting to me that she also functioned in a way like it's not it's not as if she wasn't out it was she wasn't an out whatever quote unquote outsider artist she wasn't like she wasn't functioning outside of outside of the the machinations of like cultural life but yet like how did how did that happen and yet the work retains this kind of like total like total kind of innocence it's it is it's it's like it's it's super it's super curious to me. Like I try and imagine what that looks like now, and I can't, I can't really do it. Like I can't, you know, like I can't do it. Even if you think about somebody like I don't know Kiki Smith or something like that, that's not that's not even that's like a terrible comparison. I can't I can't I cannot imagine that. Which is wild. Like we're so self-conscious, you know. Uh, I have a question. Uh, so your work, for me, creates so many different associations uh, to the body or to our history. And I'm just talking about being self-conscious. Like I'm wondering, in, in the process of making it, how many of these are you aware of and how many of them come later or, or is there like so this is what I didn't say at the beginning of this talk and I meant to is that like so I was thinking about the, the current political situation and not wanting to assume a voice of authority but it also has come out of like this desire to talk about research in this context or using that as a kind of subject for this talk came out of a co two conversations one with somebody that I'm recently hanging out with who has no involvement with the art world and was like what you know basically just asked like where 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 the importance of like how legible the, re the references that i use need to be or how legible the research needs to be and i think maybe you're asking like a similar question or at, like at least what at what points does the research kind of like float in um, and I think it's a really like I think it comes back again to this idea of animism like the research for me I'm talking to you guys about it because I think there is an opportunity to talk about it here but as far as how important it needs to be legibly in the work or how much I like make decisions to kind of bring it forward lucidly in the work as a kind of text um, I I will always defer to the like material quality of the thing itself like this is it's just ba it's just background information and if the thing is not animus like if it doesn't kind of hold the properties of the research that I am doing inside of itself without any association to like the historical then it's a, it's like a, it fails. Yeah. So it comes in and, in and out, and it's very important to my production, but to the things itself, it's only as important as it is. You know, <laughs> like it's only as important as what the work brings up. Does that answer that question a little bit? I think it's like I, th I think if there's like anything, if there's anything 
in this like like act like school zone to think about research and like it all comes all this stuff comes out of like points of curiosity and like all the my research all my textual research all my historical research is like it's just it's it's kind of in some ways it's anic it's like anecdotal and it is a fuel but it's not it's not the like source of the work Just one last one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just intrigued by your relationship to painting because there seems like there's this thread, this tiny, tiny, tiny thread of painting in your work. Like you'll describe these sculptures, and then your last comment is usually, "Oh, and a little bit of painting." Right there. Um, are you are you a slave to painting, or are you um, do you want to cut the ties, or what is? No, I don't want to cut the ties. I mean, I think I think like. Painting is really, it's like I, it's really hard. It's I find it very hard. It's very like, and I'm, and I mean that in terms of like the the. I mean that in terms of like the pleasure, in the studio. Like the act of making a painting is very, like I find it very challenging, and immersive and problematic and difficult and. Um, I don't think that I like somebody once. Somebody once said, "Well, you bet your 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 painting is the horse and sculpture is the cart." Like you're all. It's always like it's always a kind of under a backbone of painting, and I think that that has to do with the liquidity of paint. Like those choices that you make when you have a li like a liquid thing, literally a liquid thing. And the number of choices that you have to make to make that into something, the process of undergoing that is very, 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 very different. Not qualitatively better, but very different than having a thing, a thing, a thing, and combining them. Like, I mean, I'm not Rodin, but who probably, you know, is like able to able to like move that liquidity into three dimensional form, but. I like. I'm always gonna paint. I think it's like. A, I think it's a. It's a. It's a. It's a really wild thing to to do. I don't know if that surfaces in the paintings. I don't know if I'm a good painter, but I will always paint. <laughs> I think it's 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 endlessly interesting. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Beth. I must say, you know, I send out this letter of invitation to artists and. Uh, not everyone actually responds to it. Uh, you know, we get kind of the off-the-shelf uh, talk, so I, I'm really pleased and honored that you would consider the invitation and that that was a terrific connection between the problematic but important role that research plays in all our work. So thank you very much.